Hi, I'm Mark Hughes. I'm a faculty member in uh, general internal medicine and palliative care at Johns Hopkins. And I'm going to be talking to you about pain management strategies um, in colon cancer. My objectives are gonna be uh, to discuss pain management, um, pain assessment in oncology, uh, talk to you a little bit about the principles of palliative care as they relate to pain management. Um, because I see that uh, patients should uh, be empowered to take care of their, their own health care, I'm gonna talk to you about non-medication options and you know where possible, not just relying on medications to help with uh, pain management. Uh, so we'll describe a few of those. And then lastly, uh, you know, give you the overview of medication strategies, how clinicians think about approaching pain and the different medications that might be used um, based on the, the pain syndrome uh, that you're dealing with in cancer care. First of all, I wanna start with the prevalence of pain in cancer. Uh, there was a systematic review of the medical literature uh, that spanned 40 years. Uh, this was done by investigators in the Netherlands, but they were looking at uh, international studies and uh, wanted to determine the prevalence of pain in cancer patients across the world. They found that for cancer uh, at all stages, about 53% of patients reported uh, pain. Those who were getting anti-cancer treatment uh, were in active treatment had pain 59% of the time. And when the cancer was advanced, that rose to 64%. Uh, even patients who had been cured of the cancer uh, still reported pain about a third of the time. So across the board, uh, one third of the time, uh, the pain was rated as moderate or severe. Um, so definitely an issue that needs attention uh, in cancer care. In another study, a prospective observational study of over 3,000 outpatients uh, with cancer from across the United States, and um, this was both at academic medical centers as well as community oncology practices, about two thirds of patients reported having pain and one third, it was found that there was inadequate prescribing of analgesics, pain medications, to manage that pain. And when the patients followed up a month later after that initial visit in the study, uh, they still weren't getting adequate pain management. Uh, it also found that about one out of five patients had moderate to severe pain. And then for those patients with severe pain, one out of five of those patients were not even being prescribed a pain medication. The other things that predicted whether or not there'd be inadequate pain management, uh, actually uh, maybe somewhat surprising, patients that had good performance status or uh, actually had been treated for their disease and didn't have any evidence of advanced disease uh, may not have had adequate pain management. Uh, and then another one that's uh, really important to keep in mind, especially nowadays when we're thinking about health disparities, uh, if you were being treated at a, a treatment center where there was a, a majority of patients from a minority population, um, more likely that they would have inadequate pain management. Uh, and in fact, uh, minority patients were twice as likely to have under treatment of their pain. So that's really uh, important that we uh, pay attention to who our patient population is and, and try to take care of them. Also becomes important um, when we're thinking about uh, concerns for you know, health disparities uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is just a recent study published this month um, where it showed that um, during the pandemic, people are gonna be socially disconnected. They may experience loneliness. Um, they may be sort of forced to be confined to their home uh, and really not have options to leave their home. That, that could uh, uh, increase their emotional reaction to, to their um, circumstance. They might have reduced access to, you know, getting their pain management uh, to see their providers, uh, and they might be uh, experiencing, you know, these issues of social injustice or inequity. That can lead to, you know, increased problems, where you can either have um, uh, inadequate uh, social support, you could have um, uh, increased emotional reactions to uh, what's going on. Um, you could have, uh, you know, other burdens uh, with taking care of your family. Uh, all of these things could then exacerbate or, you know, keep you in pain. Uh, so it's important to recognize these additional issues that come with the pandemic. And on the right side of the screen are ways that you can think about trying to mitigate some of these things, re reduce um, the, the pain or the impact of the pandemic on the pain. That could 
try to be uh, you know increasing uh, the opportunities for uh, connecting with people. So whether that's through technology, social media, other things to to stay connected, creating peer support groups for other people with pain, um, increase obviously in telemedicine in the past few months. So delivering the healthcare online, and that could be things like uh, cognitive behavior therapy, um, CBT, which I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. Uh, it could mean uh, accessing educational resources to help manage pain, um, really trying to put, put it in the hands of patients um, to take care of their, their healthcare and pain management. Uh, and also it means, you know, uh, as a healthcare system, we need to also address those social determinants of health, uh, reduce those inequities, so that people with pain, you know, get the treatment they need. So let me talk to you for a few minutes about pain assessment and how clinicians uh, will uh, think about um, managing, first of all, you know, assessing the pain and then managing the pain. Um, and that'll start with, um, you know, where's the pain coming from? So, you know, three quarters of the time, that's gonna be coming from the tumor itself. It's either causing injury to tissue uh, causing inflammation or other problems. Um, for colon cancer, that could mean that there's invasion into the large or small intestine. Um, it could affect other organs like the liver. Uh, it could go into bone or soft tissue, or it could invade a nerve and then cause these uh, uh, painful nerve sensations. About 25% of the time, um, the etiology or the cause of the pain is actually things that um, cancer treatment is doing. Uh, so that could mean that, you know, the surgery that you had to remove the, the tumor in the first place uh, might have some lingering pain afterwards. Um, it could be side effects from chemotherapy or radiation therapy. It could be just, you know, going for a diagnostic test, you know, just uh, a blood draw for a lab test or a biopsy is going to entail some pain in and of itself. Or it could be, you know, laying on a table to get a CT scan or an MRI scan. Uh, they, they will have their own discomfort. So um, important to recognize where the pain's coming from, what, what the cause might be, and, and again, how you're going to try to uh, reduce the pain or re reduce the likelihood of pain occurring. And then for clinicians, uh, they think about the kinds of pain, um, and that can be put into a few different categories. Uh, in medicine, if the, uh, the cancer itself is causing tissue injury or inflammation, we call it nociceptive pain because uh, it's noxious, it's, it's unpleasant. Um, and based on where it is, um, then the person you know, having the pain will experience it in different ways. They may have different sensations. For instance, if it's blocking a hollow viscous, um, that's the medical term uh, for something like the intestine, then it's gonna feel like a gnawing or cramping pain. If it's cancer that's moved into the bone or muscle, it could be aching or stabbing or throbbing. Um, if it's stretching the capsule of an organ, like the liver, um, or it's irritating the lining, uh, like in the lung, the pleura, uh, then you might experience either uh, stabbing pain or aching pain. If it's affecting a nerve, um, that's called neuropathic pain, and that can either be in the central nervous system, like the brain or uh, the spinal cord, or it can be in a peripheral nerve somewhere in the body, and then it's going to feel like a burning or a shooting discomfort. Sometimes the pain is psychogenic, and that's not to say that it's you know all in your head. Uh, it's a recognition that um, there's an influence of um, our emotional state on how our body feels. Um, so if we're distressed, if there's psychological distress or emotional upset, uh, that can translate into feeling pain. Um, or you know it's going to be a combination of those three things. Uh, and sometimes and very often in, in cancer, it's a mix of these, and then the clinician has to try to tease out which one seems to be the predominant cause or predominant kind of pain. And what are the consequences if the pain is not adequately treated? Well, obviously a person having pain is gonna have unnecessary suffering. Uh, they may have decreased ability to cope with their illness, uh, it just becomes harder to, to deal with the illness itself. Uh, may have effects on their sleep. Uh, you can't sleep if you're in pain. Uh, you may not want to eat. Uh, your mental alertness uh, may be diminished. Uh, you know, just having pain is going to interfere with your daily activities. You may not be able to do the things you want to do. Um, it might require more assistance or care from other people. 
Uh, if it's really bad pain, you might need to go into the hospital for, for unmanaged symptoms. Uh, and those could be unplanned, not part of your, your you know, standard cancer care. Uh, and there may be you know, delays in your anti-cancer treatment if, if the pain is really interfering with getting to appointments or um, because you needed to go into the hospital and so on. And that's where you know, something like palliative care can, can, come, can come in and really try to help manage the pain. So we define palliative care as specialized medical care for people living with a serious illness. The intent, the focus, is on providing relief of the symptoms and stress of illness, and in this case, you know, the cancer. The overall goal is to improve quality of life, and that's both for the patient and also their loved ones uh, who are experiencing the cancer along with the patient. It's appropriate at any age and at any stage in a serious illness, uh, and palliative care can be provided along with curative treatment. It's not like you, you treat the cancer and then you, you, when you don't treat the cancer anymore, you turn to palliative care. No, palliative care should happen at the same time. Uh, and that's been recommended by uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. So going back to 2017, they said that uh, at the time of diagnosis and preferably within the first eight weeks of being diagnosed with cancer, there should be integration of palliative care into the cancer care plan. Um, that should be done by the oncologist, by a palliative care clinician, by a whole team uh, to really make sure that um, not only pain, but other symptoms are being managed. And there's uh, a distinction in the literature, you know, the medical literature about uh, primary versus specialty or secondary palliative care. So primary palliative care is delivered by either a primary care provider, you know, like a general internist like me, uh, or an oncologist. So they should have the basic skills that all clinicians should have to take care of basic pain and symptom management, as well as discussing goals of care with patients, you know, uh, informed consent and, and making sure they're understanding of their disease and its treatment. Whereas specialty palliative care, you know, is done by specialists. They've gone through additional training. Um, often it's an interdisciplinary team. So not only physicians, but nurse practitioners or physician assistants, nurses, chaplains, social workers, pharmacists, a whole team that gives their input about uh, how to best manage uh, whatever the problem is, whether it's pain or other complex symptoms. And then that team can also help with complex decisions. Um, you know, if it's really involved concerns about uh, existential concerns, you know, how do I deal with this cancer, for instance, um, the palliative care team uh, can be brought in by the oncologist uh, to help with those things, with, with those discussions and with those symptom management. So let's talk a little bit about uh, pain management itself. Um, it starts with comprehensive assessment. Uh, so a clinician, if you're, you're seeing your oncologist or seeing a palliative care physician, uh, they're gonna start with the medical history. They're gonna wanna know about your current or past cancer treatment, um, whether you have any other significant illnesses, um, have you had pre-existing conditions that, that cause pain? You have arthritis or other, other conditions that um, have led to some chronic pain. What's your personal history? Um, you know, how does that bear on um, your cancer treatment and you know, pain management? Um, you're gonna undergo obviously a physical exam to see uh, where the pain is, uh, and what you know, factors might be associated with it. Uh, you might be sent for laboratory tests or imaging studies uh, all of that's uh, to try to figure out uh, where the pain is coming from, what the cause is, uh, and then that's going to help develop the strategies for, for, ma uh, for managing it. Uh, they're going to want to know, you know, have you been uh, treated for pain in the past? Um, what are the therapies that have been uh, offered? Uh, how successful were they? Uh, did you have side effects? Uh, all those sorts of things. It's also important, uh, especially from a palliative care perspective, to sort of know what the meaning of pain is for you. Um, are there cultural beliefs or existential concerns that influence how you interpret pain or how you feel pain? Um, and, and you wanna know about that in terms of the cancer treatment as well. Uh, there may be concerns about uh, whether things like opioids, if they're gonna be prescribed, whether they might be misused. So what are your risk factors uh, for that to happen? developing an addiction, for instance. Um, 
It's also important to really understand uh, pain's effect on your daily functioning, so your functional status. Uh, is it affecting your walking ability, your working, uh, your relationships with other people? Uh, as I mentioned before, is it affecting your sleep or your appetite? Um, is it in, uh, just in general affecting your enjoyment of life? Because that's, that's a main goal, improving quality of life um, while you're getting cancer treatment. The clinician also will need to know, you know, me being patient-centered, what are your goals? What are your goals for pain management? Um, and um, that is going to be including, you know, what's your general activity? Um, what's been the influence of the, uh, the pain on your mood? Um, what are you hoping for? What are you worried about? Uh, all, those, um, mani that all those things matter in managing the pain. Um, what are your avenues for psychosocial support? Not just you know the clinical team that's taking care of you, but your family, your friends. Uh, how are they providing support for you in, in coping with the pain? A good resource uh, that you uh, may want to check out is uh, from the American Cancer Society. So, it has uh, some nice uh, review of cancer pain and understanding it as well as managing it. Uh, so, I suggest you check out their website. So let me talk about non-medication options because, as I said, I want to empower people to pursue things that they can do on their own. Um, and some of these, you know, you might need the assistance of a clinician uh, to guide you into these things. But it includes things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'll talk about, uh, physical therapy to keep your body as fit as possible and, and moving. Um, it may mean physical modalities like putting ice packs or cold packs. Uh, or using TENS units, electrical stimulation. Uh, these come with you know, some caveats that you have to make sure that these are okay. And if there's been any damaged or injured tissue, whether it's okay to apply heat or cold or electrical stimulation, um, but they might, might provide some pain relief. Uh, a lot of people think about integrative or complementary medicine, um, whether it's mind-body interventions or acupuncture, massage, healing touch, all of these may have a role, and again, it depends on the patient's goals um, and what's important to them in terms of pursuing some of these things. Let me first of all talk about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Uh, so it first of all recognizes that pain is multidimensional. Um, it's both affecting the body and the mind, and that you can use the mind, you can harness the mind uh, to help the body. So um, often when we're having pain, we interpret it. Um, we often have negative thoughts associated with the pain. Uh, so if we can retrain our mind in how we interpret pain, um, that's going to help our body out. Um, so there's a skills development, a skills training uh, in adjusting our interpretations of pain. And if that's done well, we're going to have a better means of coping with uh, not only the cancer, but with the pain gives us a better sense of control, that, that we are in control of our pain, uh, and gives us confidence or self-efficacy that, that we can manage this, we can do it. The other intent of cognitive behavioral therapy is to get rid of those negative thoughts, that dysfunctional thinking, like catastrophizing, like if you're having increased pain, you're thinking, oh my God, my, my cancer must be spreading or, or getting worse. Uh, so eliminating those negative thoughts and, and focusing on the positive, what can you do to manage this pain? is part of CBT. And then it also means, you know, doing some behaviors, doing some things on your own activities, uh, like relaxation techniques that I'll talk about, breathing, deep breathing, um, to get your, your body in tune uh, to then manage the pain. The other part of this, the cognitive part, is education. So um, if you have a better understanding of the rationale for your pain treatment, um, then you're going to be able to be more confident that you can manage it. So that might mean, you know, how do you take your medication? Do you know the proper technique? Do you know when and how and so often? Um, how do you communicate with your, your clinical team? You know, can you describe your pain, tell them, you know, how you responded tr to treatment? That's part of the educational process. That's part of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, there's physical rehabilitation, so physical therapy and occupational therapy. So um, obviously this has to be geared to, you know, what your level of performance status is. Um, uh, you can't overdo it. Uh, if you're, you're somewhat um, 
limited in what you're physically able to do, then you don't want to push it. Um, and it also depends on what your goals are uh, in terms of staying physically active. But the intent of uh, PT and OT are to increase flexibility, uh, make sure that your muscles and joints are stable, uh, that, that when you're walking or you're up and about that uh, you have that stability, and really making sure you have range of motion. And what they found uh, is that there are numerous benefits. So uh, decreasing stiffness, musculoskeletal stiffness, uh, can then help with uh, decreasing pain. Um, if you're physically active, you're going to release those endorphins. You know, you talk about the runner's high. Well, same thing with even, you know, um, uh, less strenuous forms of exercise. You can release endorphins to then help with pain management. If you're better conditioned, you're better physically capable, uh, that increases your aerobic capacity. You get better oxygen delivery uh, to different parts of your body. And that's also going to help with uh, your sensation of pain. Uh, if you're physically active, that may also help with fatigue, uh, and then that is going to help with pain control. If you're tired, you feel more, more pain. So if you're less tired, um, less pain sensation. And again, being physically active can in improve quality of life. And then there are a range of mind-body interventions. So uh, the idea here, similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, is that you're training the mind to influence the body. And they can be standalone practices that, that you do, or um, maybe they're used in combination with pain medicine. And there have been studies that show if, if, um, if you're on pain medicine and you introduce these mind-body interventions, you might actually decrease the dosing. Uh, you may, not, may be less reliant on the medication uh, to manage the pain. There are gonna be a variety of things that can be done. So it could be relaxation therapy. Uh, there, the focus is on you know, getting the body relaxed. It may mean, you know, repeating a word to yourself, or like a mantra. It may mean uh, repetitive breathing, like just focusing on your breathing. Um, all those, you know, just focusing on your body, a, a particular aspect of your body or your mind, uh, then helps you to forget about the pain. It may mean things like meditation, and there's obviously been a, a growth of mindfulness, um, you know, attention to mindfulness and in society in the past few years. Uh, people that are uh, spiritual, religious uh, can use prayer that's been used for centuries. Uh, the same idea that, that you're using your mind to, uh, to get a calming attitude towards uh, your pain and your illness. There can be more uh, you know, uh, historic uh, techniques, yoga, tai chi, qigong, um, as ways to move the body um, to then help with uh, the energy in the body. Uh, it may mean uh, imagery, so um, you know, thinking about pleasant things or uh, being guided by a clinician to uh, you know, bring that imagery into your mind it may mean things like hypnosis or learning biofeedback about how you can control things like your heart rate or um, bodily sensations. Um, you're trained to do that, uh, and that helps re reduce the pain. Lots of different ways of bringing in either music therapy or dance therapy or art therapy as, again, a way to focus away from the pain and, and other enjoyable things. So it distracts the mind away from the pain. Acupuncture, some people are familiar with. So either using a needle or pressure on sensitivity points in the body. Um, there's been you know, evidence that uh, this is beneficial for different kinds of chronic pain. Uh, also showing that it can reduce uh, your need for pain medicine. Um, it's generally considered to be low risk of harm in, in having these practices done. Um, and for something like uh, uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, something I'll talk about a little later, um, um, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists says acupuncture might be a mod modality to help with, um, with CIPN. The downsides is that, uh, you know, this may be something that patients have to pay for themselves, um, may not be available in their area, uh, but if it is available and you're interested in it, uh, it might be worth uh, trying out and seeing if it works for you. Uh, massage um, does not have a lot of, um, you know, evidence for benefit uh, in the medical literature at least, uh, but it's also something that's been used for centuries. So it might provide some temporary relief especially of um, musculoskeletal pain. 
So you're applying either fixed or movable pressure to different parts of the body. Um, and that might be, uh, you know, relaxing or, you know, relieve some of the, the pain in those body parts. Uh, other techniques that have been uh, introduced in the past few years are healing touch or Reiki, people may have heard about. Um, so this is an idea that there's, are there energy fields in the body uh, and this healing touch, uh, even if it's not directly touching the body, but, but uh, connecting with those energy fields um, provides some pain relief. Um, and there's been some, you know, demonstrated evidence in the medical literature that these things work. Um, not only with, you know, pain reduction, but reducing stress and helping people relax. So also something uh, that you may want to look into. So then we turn to medication management, and uh, there are going to be a few different things to be aware of. Um, first of all, there are a variety of pain syndromes. Uh, so where is the pain coming from? What's causing it? Uh, as we've mentioned before, it may be the tumor itself is um, involving a particular body part. And based on that body part, uh, may help you decide which medication to use. As we talked about before, you know, an obstruction of the intestines, uh, there are going to be different medications used for that kind of pain. Uh, if it's in, invading a nerve, you're going to have different um, medications that work on, on the nerves. Uh, there may be what are called paraneoplastic syndromes where the tumor releases a hormone or other substance, and then that has effects on other parts of the body um, that leads to pain. Um, so if you understand that underlying substance, you might be able to, to address it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, chemo and ther chemotherapy-induced uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, obviously, people that uh, undergo surgery, uh, they may have lingering pain after the operation. Uh, people that have radiation, um, uh, depending on the body part, you know, if it's the skin, uh, there may be inflammation in the skin. If it's in the intestines, they may have something called enteritis, so inflammation in uh, the intestine uh, or in the rectum. Uh, there may be fistula development, you know, between, um, you know, the intestines or the colon uh, or other body parts. Um, so those may, may lead to pain. So you need to, again, have that thorough assessment by a clinician, um, where is the pain coming from? And the goals are going to be, you know, number one, it's going to be patient-centered. So, um, you know, it starts with the patient and, and what, what they're after. Um, obviously, we want to try to relieve the pain. May not be able to fully get rid of the pain, but at least bring it down to a tolerable level. Um, one big goal is improving function. Uh, so making sure that you can do the things you want to do. Uh, and we want to do this if we're introducing medications, make sure uh, that the, if there are side effects, that they are minimized as much as possible. Um, and that's going to be patient dependent on, on how bad the side effects are and if you need to adjust medications. You usually start as a clinician, you're going to start with the intensity of the pain. And I'm sure you're all familiar with like the pain scale rated from zero to 10. Um, based on the intensity of the pain, that's going to uh, help decide which pain medication to use, uh, as well as, you know, where's the pain coming from the etiology uh, will favor one kind of medication over another. In general, uh, opioids, so opioid analgesics, um, uh, things like morphine or, you know, members of that family uh, are going to be the mainstay of treatment, uh, especially if it's moderate or severe pain. Um, Over-the-counter uh, pain medicines may not be enough to, to take care of that pain, so you may need a prescription for an opioid analgesic. And, and in general, you know, you want to start low and go slow, in introducing pain medication, see if a lower dose will work. If not, then you gradually go up on the dose. It's important, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for clinicians to be aware of if there's any concerns uh, about misuse. Um, what are the person's risk um, for either overdosing or using the medication in inappropriately or it being diverted to other people um, in their surroundings? Um, so all these things have to be paid attention to, especially if there's going to be a, a chronic need for pain medication. And then another thing that has to be addressed, and I won't go into great detail about these things, but um, uh, there may be attitudinal uh, concerns that have to be addressed. So uh, people fearing becoming addicted to pain medication, and obviously with the opioid epidemic, uh, that has been a, more of a concern in recent years. 
And there's a difference between tolerance to medication, so being dependent on it and sort of having a physiologic response to it, especially if it's uh, taken away, you have sort of withdrawal symptoms. That's not the same thing as addiction. So uh, in addiction, there's a craving and you take more and more and more. Um, that we want to avoid. Um, but tolerance is to be expected if you're going to need a pain medication long term. Um, there are the other concerns about adverse effects, but again, um, with you know the growth of palliative care, we should be able to manage side effects and um, really make sure that these are not problematic. Um, you want to figure out other ways of uh, you know dealing with the pain that you're not just relying on these um, you know pain medications, and if there are other psychosocial or spiritual concerns that you're also addressing those. Now, when you're choosing medication, uh, the World Health Organization says you should uh, use the pain relief ladder. Uh, and their motto is, you know, choose the right drug at the right dose at the right time. Um, so if it's, you know, mild pain, and that might be a, you know, pain score of zero to three or four, uh, then you're going to use non-opioids. Um, so what you can get over the counter. Um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or acetaminophen, um, uh, those kind of medications, uh, or you know, an adjuvant that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, may help to take care of that uh, mild pain. If it's moderate to severe pain, so four to seven on a scale or four to six on a scale, um, then you're going to want to think about a, an opioid medication. Um, uh, with or without an adjuvant medication that we'll talk about. And the adjuvant is uh, selected based on um, what you think is causing the pain, what kind of pain it is. And if it's really severe pain, you might need stronger uh, opioid medications. Um, so the ultimate goal is really trying to be free of pain or reducing the pain to a level that you have an enjoyment in the quality of your life and you can function. And uh, how the clinician decides on the dose is going to be an individualized decision. So um, your age, um, uh, so older people might have um, potential for more side effects from the medication due to their uh, different metabolism. Uh, we want to know if there are other medical conditions. Do you have kidney problems or liver problems that might affect the metabolism of the drug? Um, have you experienced side effects before? Um, do we want to try to watch out for those? Uh, there may be, you know, personal issues of, you know, can you afford the medication or is it covered by your insurance plan? How often do you need to take it? Um, is it a take, uh, taken by mouth? Is it something that's on the skin, you know, a topical medication or a patch? Uh, is it something that needs to be given uh, in the vein, uh, you know, an IV or subcutaneous injection? Um, all of these are going to matter in terms of trying to um, figure out what's best for a particular patient. Uh, if you are prescribing an, an opioid analgesic, um, there might be the need for, you know, a Tylenol or Motrin or Aleve or, you know, co-analgesics uh, because they're going to come at the pain from a different angle. Uh, it's very important when you're starting pain medication to try to prevent side effects from happening. Uh, so for opioid analgesics, they do slow down uh, the bowels. Uh, so it's important to make sure you have a bowel regimen to uh, prevent constipation whether that's Senna or polyethylene glycol, you know, being prescribed up front uh, along with the pain medication uh, to prevent there from being problems. Uh, some medications will have nausea as a side effect, so also uh, having anti-nausea medicine available. And then there's a constant reassessment. So how is the pain uh, doing? Uh, is it responding to treatment? Uh, are there side effects? If it's doing well, maybe you can cut back on the dose. If, if you're not having adequate pain relief, you might need to increase the dose. So um, constant check-in with a clinician um, to make sure you're getting the right medication. And then besides you know, the pain medications like uh, opioid analgesics, uh, there might be adjuvants. Um, so they might be used in combination with opioids. Uh, and it's going to be dependent, you know, maybe uh, you're having difficulty sleeping, so you have insomnia, you might want to choose an adjuvant medication that has drowsiness as a side effect because you're killing two birds with one stone. Uh, if you're adding in an adjuvant, uh, maybe you start at a low dose and you, you have to gradually increase the dose to find what's going to work for a particular patient. 
So you have to accept that there may be some trial and error in finding both the right dose as well as the right medication. Um, a lot of these medications are geared towards neuropathic pain. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, knowing that um, it's gonna vary depending on, you know, your response to the pain may vary depending on what kind of nerve pain uh, is causing the problem. And then based on the body part or, you know, the cause of the pain, uh, that can help make you choose which adjuvant. So if it's inflammation, then you want something that uh, calms down inflammation. So an anti-inflammatory, like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, NSAID, or steroids calm down inflammation. If um, it's bone pain, you know, cancer has gone into the bone, again, anti-inflammatories might be helpful, or bisphosphonates that are, you know, otherwise used for like osteoporosis to strengthen bone, that can help with cancer pain uh, that's in the bone. Uh, for neuropathic pain, nerve pain, there are a variety of choices. So antidepressants, um, historic class called tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline or nortriptyline uh, and low doses uh, can help with nerve pain. Or newer agents um, like duloxetine or venlafaxine, uh, those are also antidepressants and can help with, with chronic pain. Um, because they work on uh, nerve pain. Some people are put on seizure medicine, anticonvulsants, because uh, they're also working at the, the nerve level. Um, people may be familiar with gabapentin or pregabalin, uh, or there may be, because it's nerve endings, you may use topical things that are applied directly to the skin, like anesthetics, uh, lidocaine, uh, or 1% menthol that people can buy over the counter, capsation, you know, so what's in hot peppers, um, some people find it, you know, um, irritating if it's, you know, that heat that you get from putting on the skin, but there may actually be a numbing effect over time that helps with the chronic pain, the nerve pain. Uh, and then there's also formulations of using ketamine that are, that's prescribed uh, to deal with that local level in the nerve endings. Let me talk a little bit, uh, uh, because we're, we're talking about colon cancer, uh, issues of uh, bowel obstruction. So, uh, that can either come as a result of the tumor itself, it may be from scar tissue uh, after surgery, or if you've gotten radiation uh, into the abdomen, uh, that could also uh, cause scar tissue um, affecting, uh, you know, the bowel uh, and, and leading to obstruction. Uh, there is going to be a question of, you know, if it's acute, um, you need to seek prompt evaluation and whether there's a need for surgery, or if it's in the intestines, whether something like a stent can be put in, by interventional radiology. Um, you may need uh, a tube, uh, like a nasogastric tube or a tube that goes directly into the stomach um, to take out the gas so it's not causing that bloating or distension in the abdomen and in the, in the intestines. Uh, you may need medications that would decrease secretions you know, that the, the intestines are normally making or you know, there's a increased peristalsis and movement of the intestines or there's you know, inflammation and, and edema, swelling in the intestinal wall. So these medications, whether it's anticholinergics or something called octreotide or steroids uh, can be used for those particular uh, features of bowel obstruction. And then another big uh, category that uh, people need to think about um, is if you're getting uh, chemotherapy, especially cytotoxic drugs, and I, and I give you a list there, of um, you know, potential players. The big ones um, are uh, taxanes and platinum, so taxol or cisplatin, people may have heard of. Um, any of these can cause nerve damage. Uh, and if that's the case, um, uh, you, obviously the oncologist in choosing the regimen you know, to treat the cancer has to be aware of, do you have a, a potentially a, you know, pre-existing condition that puts you at risk for neuropathy, like you know, diabetes can affect nerve endings. Uh, do you already have a neuropathy? Um, so you're going to be uh, have to be extra careful about using these um, these cytotoxic agents. If you start to develop these symptoms as a result of the chemotherapy, the oncologist should decide whether they need to delay a dose, or reduce the dose, or substitute for other chemotherapy, or maybe it means even stopping the chemotherapy if the uh, neuropathy is bad enough. Um, the clinical evidence, you know, in the literature says that maybe duloxetine, uh, that antidepressant that I talked about before that's used for neuropathic pain, maybe there's some benefit in using that. 
but a lot of uh, other therapies, um, other medications really haven't been uh, shown to be uh, effective. You might nonetheless um, want to give them a consideration. So exercise therapy, you know, keeping the body moving might help uh, the nerves. Acu acupuncture could be considered. Um, cannabinoids, so cannabis or medical marijuana uh, might be considered. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, scrambler therapy is a new thing where it uses electrical stimulation uh, through the skin, uh, and that can sort of help with the uh, the nerve sensation, uh, that neuropathy that you're getting from uh, CIPN. So let me talk a little bit about cannabinoids since uh, a lot of people are interested in this topic uh, nowadays. Um, so in our bodies, we have our own endocannabinoids. Um, uh, they have a role in our body for uh, providing analgesia, providing pain relief uh, when it, there's a stress-induced uh, uh, pain, uh, can modulate uh, risks of anxiety and depression, um, and you know daily stressors which increase anxiety can also increase pain. There are two kinds of receptors uh, for cannabinoids, CB1, uh, which is in the central nervous system, and CB2, which is in the rest of the body, but um, more, more, most especially in immune cells. Um, so if there's inflammation and the immune system is, is brought in, um, that can lead to hyperalgesia, increased pain as a result of the um, uh, inflammation. And this is shown, shown schematically. And just to know that CB1 receptors uh, are found uh, in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. So that becomes important uh, in colon cancer uh, because um, these receptors are going to have uh, influence on uh, the motility, the movement of the intestines, uh, their secretion of, of uh, substances, um, the inflammation in the intestines, uh, etc. So, um, you know, a lot of the studies that have been done on uh, cannabis um, are not rigorous, uh, they're not randomized controlled trials. Um, but uh, I'll give you a few uh, references here at the bottom of the, uh, the slide, um, have been mostly done on chronic pain, not just uh, cancer pain. Um, but uh, some studies show reduction in, in pain uh, compared to placebo. Um, may mean that there's less use of other kinds of analgesics like opioids. Um, there may be some benefit in neuropathic pain especially. Um, but other pain populations, um, as I said, with cancer pain, not clear-cut evidence of, of being beneficial. Um, doesn't uh, show impacts on physical or emotional functioning, um, whether there's evidence that it helps with sleep or you know, um, global impressions of, of how you're doing with your pain, uh, not totally clear. Uh, and there's concerns that there could be high rates of adverse events, so side effects uh, from cannabis. And there's the list of things that can happen, dizziness, dry mouth, nausea, fatigue, sleepiness, uh, euphoria, you know, uh, that high sensation, uh, vomiting, um, disorientation, drowsiness, confusion, hallucinations, you know, so we have to be careful about using uh, these, um, these agents. People may have heard about uh, cannabidiol, uh, so CBD. Um, uh, derived from plants, um, no longer, uh, you know, FDA regulated because uh, THC, if there's no, you know, THC in it, which is the, the substance that gives you the high, um, then it's no longer considered a controlled substance. So it can be sold, you know, over the counter and, you know, over the internet. Um, the FDA, FDA still uh, regulates uh, CBD products. They, they can still, you know, step in. Uh, and if there is THC, it is still a controlled substance. So uh, at the federal government level, this, this still is an issue. It's important to note that with CBD products, uh, there was a study a few years ago that they, they looked at 84 uh, samples being sold uh, over the internet and 58 of them did not have the amount of CBD that was actually uh, supposed to be in the product. Uh, so you may be buying something and it doesn't actually have CBD in it. Um, so that's important to, to recognize. And then the other thing um, you know, is going to be that there are, there are potential harms uh, with using uh, uh, cannabinoids. Uh, so whether it's medical marijuana where you go to a dispensary to get it, uh, um, 
there has to be a, a risk stratification. So working with your you know oncologist, with your uh, primary care provider, if they're going to you know um, you know talk to you about uh, going to a dispensary, um, you want to know if there's any personal family history of mental health or addiction. Um, because these agents could lead to psychosis. You want to know what the risk for psychosis is. Are you on other medications that increase your risk for psychosis? What's going to be the impact on your driving or you know, work? Is it going to be monitored at work? Um, your education, your parenting, um, all of these are going to matter in terms of uh, potential harms. Um, and you know, there may be cognitive issues associated with these agents. Uh, if you do uh, you know, get medical marijuana, you want to try to choose agents that have low potency THC um, or that there's a balance between the THC and the CBD. The CBD is probably the main, main player in, in helping with pain relief. And then to just recognize that uh, about 10 to 30 percent of people, you know, maybe three out of 10 people uh, could have a cannabis use disorder and that becomes problematic. That becomes an addictive um, problem. And then I'll end, uh, I won't go into great detail about these things, but um, you know, there are obviously other options for managing pain. Um, so a radiation oncologist can talk about radiation therapy options. Uh, there may be pain service. Uh, so pain specialists uh, have a variety of options. Um, ketamine has gotten increased attention in the past few years, not only for treatment of depression, but also uh, for pain relief um, that can be given IV uh, you might need to be in the hospital to, to get that. Um, pain medicine specialists can do nerve blocks or epidural uh, blocks. Uh, they can deliver medication right into the spinal tract, uh, into the spinal cord. Um, they can give spinal cord stimulators uh, to reduce pain. Uh, if there's been um, fractures in the vertebrae and the, the spine bones, um, you know, uh, boosting those up with vertebroplasty uh, or, you know, directly going into tumors and ablating them. So uh, using ultrasound or CT guided um, tumor ablation are other ways of also managing pain to, to reduce the effects of the tumor on the, the surrounding tissue. So lots of ways that uh, you can manage pain and, and something that you can get on top of and get in control of working with your clinical team uh, to manage the pain and um, make sure you can live the life and, and function uh, the way you want to. So I thank you all for your attention. I hope that was informative. I'm going to be happy to answer any questions you have. <clears throat> so one of the questions was on uh, hip pain. Uh, if it came after radiation, um, I guess, uh, again, you always start with an evaluation of where it might be coming from. Uh, if it was directly caused by the radiation, I don't know if the radiation is, is finished uh, and this is sort of residual uh, after that's happened. Um, might need uh, evaluation of whether there's been any thinning of the bone uh, or uh, inflammation in the bone. Um, doing you know, physical therapy uh, to get the joint as mobile as possible, uh, reduce any stiffness is uh, obviously a good thing. Um, and then it's going to be with a you know, clinician either uh, the radiation oncologist or a medical oncologist or a palliative care clinician to um, determine if there's something directly for the bone, uh, like a bisphosphonate that might be helpful to strengthen it, or uh, because of bone pain, uh, you know, generally uh, anything that reduces inflammation, either an anti-inflammatory or a steroid uh, might be an option. Uh, and then lastly, uh, an opioid analgesic. Um, to help manage the pain, as well as all the other, you know, non-medication options that I, I reviewed in the talk. The other question was about uh, palliative care. So uh, we have a sparsity of uh, palliative care clinicians in the United States, you know, for all the patients that have serious illness and all the patients that have cancer, we don't have enough palliative care clinicians. Uh, and therefore, any one uh, region or you know, oncology center uh, may only have either a physician or a nurse practitioner as the primary um, person for palliative care. You may not have the whole team. Generally, teams are available for inpatients. So if you're in the hospital, then you have that uh, coordinated care with 
you know, nurses and chaplains and social workers and, and pharmacists. Uh, in the outpatient setting, it might be a little more limited. Um, if, if the, you know, palliative care clinician hasn't been fully responsive to your needs, um, you know, just suggested a pain medication, but you think other modalities uh, might be helpful in your case, then I think it's a matter of discussion with that person of, um, you know, what else could they suggest uh, or, you know, working with the oncologist or primary care physician uh, to look into some of these other options without, you know, just relying on that one palliative care clinician. The other question about uh, CBD, uh, so I don't have any particular products uh, to, to recommend. Um, again, I would uh, try to recommend ones that you, you know, have some evidence that they've been tested uh, to know that the ingredients are pure. Um, often with any kind of uh, supplements or non-FDA regulated, um, you know, over-the-counter medications or, or supplements, um, you want to make sure there aren't any toxins in them. Uh, and you also want to make sure that when it says it has X, Y, or Z ingredient, that those are actually in there. So wh whatever quality testing uh, can be done, if you can get uh, background knowledge about that, uh, that would be a more reliable product to, to then choose. Uh, and it may be a trial and error uh, of trying a particular product, seeing if it uh, helps, if it doesn't, moving on to an, another one. Uh, the other question I saw was with regard to adhesions uh, from multiple uh, surgeries in the abdomen. That's a, a difficult problem. Multiple, multiple surgeries are uh, going to have more uh, scar tissue and adhesions. I think the biggest thing there is making sure that the bowels are moving. Uh, so there may be pockets of uh, either slowed transit, uh, decreased peristalsis, or um, tethering of the intestines. Uh, due to the um, to the scar tissue, to the adhesions. Uh, so really making sure that things are moving through. Um, uh, so use of laxatives, uh, if there are spasms associated with, sometimes there's increased peristalsis to try to push through any, you know, blockage or, or narrowing in the intestines. Um, there are antispasmodic medications uh, that could be used uh, for any kind of chronic pain in relation to adhesions. There, there could certainly be a role for opioid analgesics, uh, and then obviously choosing the lowest dose possible um, and finding out what works best because the opioids are going to have the side effect of constipation. So it's going to be a, a you know, balancing act there. Um, the generally for, you know, keeping the balance moving, actually may not want to do a lot of fiber supplements. Uh, too bulky when you have a lot of adhesions may make it difficult to pass through some areas. Soluble fiber is a good idea, but, but anything that's too bulky might actually um, counter what you're trying to achieve in terms of moving uh, the intestines and getting things uh, through the system. I think those are all the questions I saw. Any others? So a person doing a scrambler therapy, um, that seems different. And then two tubs of water and one cold and one hot. Um, so again, that uh, depends on the, the nature of the pain, whether it's uh, chronic or acute, uh, whether it'll be more responsive to heat or to cold, um, you know, muscle spasms, um, tightness of muscles often respond better to heat. Acute inflammation responds better to cold, uh, so decreasing the inflammation. Um, and, and then there are some that would advocate, especially for musculoskeletal pain, that you alternate one versus the other. Um, and again, that, that may work. Um, it's a different uh, notion of scrambler therapy than I'm used to, this, this hot and cold sensation, because um, there's actually intricate um, you know, electrical stimulation uh, electrodes and so on that are placed on the skin uh, to help with that neuropathic pain. Um, but if that works for you, uh, this hot and cold sensation, um, then you know, use things that work. Okay, I think that should do it. All right, thank you all. Uh, good luck and enjoy the rest of the conference.